Welcome as you guys come on in. We see our participants are growing, which is always nice to see. And if you have a chance, if you can put in the chat, uh, where are you from? Because that would that's also interesting for us to, to hear about. And then also, if you have a chance, because when you put it in the poll, they'll actually give us a little bit more information and in a, in a little bar chart. And you know how we love our data. So if you can also address in the polls, what is your role? So we'd love to know that information. We'll have other polls that we'll try to prompt you guys to fill out, but you know, fill out, fill out anything as you go along. And they suggested when we were practicing that it takes a while for people to get on. So in the first few minutes, we kind of wait and, and make sure that people come in and before we actually start chatting. So I'm kind of watching the participants uh, go up. Oh, welcome back, Jenny. Thank you, doggone it. That just about gave me a heart attack. <laughs> okay, so back where we were <laughs> before, so I'm in Zoom. So we're, yeah, we're, 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 live. we're live. So if you go on Zoom, now that it's started, the chat should, should be having where people are from. And then um, I asked people to start filling out the poll on the roll. Okay, so. All right. I don't see Give any. It. I don't see any chat yet. Okay. So then the, um, I can help you find. Oh, okay, Jennifer, thanks. Now the pathable thing. <laughs> Give it about one more minute and then we'll start introducing ourselves and talk about what this session is going to look like. It's going to be a little bit different than some of the presentations um, you guys are used to going to. Judy, can you see the chat and polls? Um, yes. Awesome. I'm going to mute for a second and take care of that. <laughs> All right, so I think we will get started and talk about what the session is gonna look like. We really wanted to get together a group of really amazing implementers of rural implementation of PBIS, what it looks like in rural places. Um, and we have these incredible people who are doing really incredible work and really wanted to share their stories and, and what they have found in implementation rather than do uh, a, a presentation. So how we're gonna do this is that we're gonna have, we have some pre-prepared questions that we'll go through. We'll have some polls and then the chat feature. So please feel free to participate in that chat. Um, Ginny will help us with some of those uh, questions, bringing it to the group. So if you have any questions for the panel, and uh, that's about it. So we're hoping it's gonna be a little bit more of an organic conversation about rural implementation. Um, I will introduce myself, I'm Laura Kern. I work at University of South Florida and um, interested in behavior. I came into um, special education because of my son was diagnosed with um, autism and ADHD and eventually anxiety. So I have a little bit more of a parent perspective and kind of lived 
lived experiences as we go through um, special education. And that's a little bit about my background coming in. Right now, I co-lead with Heather George, a rural work group on PBIS implementation. And we've been meeting regularly and trying to provide a couple of resources for rural settings. If you look in the files, we have a bunch of links of things coming out of the TA Center for rural settings that hopefully will be helpful to you guys. And now I'm gonna pass it on to Ginny, if you introduce yourself. No. Oh. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ginny Kelly. Um, I probably a little more known in the PBIS world as Ginny O'Connell. Um, I was the state coordinator for PBIS in Georgia um, up until five years ago. Since retiring, I have been doing a lot of consulting in the last two years consulting with the Florida PBIS project. So I'm happy to be here today. I'll be monitoring the chat boxes and trying to respond um, to any questions you have. And I think you're in for a really great session. So I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Dr. Jennifer Swanson Hilbo. I'm a school psychologist and a district-wide PBIS coach uh, in a large special education cooperative in Northern Illinois. We range from suburban to rural. Um, I am also the technical assistant for this presentation, so I will be turning my video off. Thanks. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Rosie Cooper. I am currently uh, serving as an assistant professor at LSU's campus in Shreveport, uh, Louisiana, where I live. Um, prior to taking this role, I have worked in um, urban environment as a school PBIS coach uh, way back in my K-12 early teaching days. And from there, I have served as a district PBIS coordinator in an urban and also rural uh, school district. And so um, I currently am still contracting uh, with a couple of school districts back in Georgia um, on PBIS. And so I'm happy to be here with you guys today. Hey everybody, um, my name is Morgan Gay. I work in Green County School System um, in Georgia, the same district that Rosie worked in. I am the PBIS coach at the middle school in our district. We are a small district, we have three schools and um, we have been implementing PBIS for the past five years. Um, previous to that, I was a PBIS coach in a more suburban school so I have experiences there as well, but most of my time has been spent as the PBIS coach in Greene County. Did you mention that you just got teacher of the year? And I am the Greene County School System District Teacher of the Year. That was a, a wonderful surprise for us, but I wanted, wanted to share that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alejandra Gaiva and I am the District uh, PBIS Coordinator for Southside ISD, which is located uh, in the San Antonio, Texas area. We're um, actually a rural district kind of outside of the city limits of San Antonio uh, within Bear County. Um, we have about eight, we have eight campuses, one high school and um, one early childhood, four elementaries and two middle school campuses with approximately 6,000 students enrolled. Uh, we've been implementing PBIS uh, since about 2015. So we're fairly new, uh, but all campuses have um, been implementing uh, with fidelity for the most part. Um, and then of course, due to COVID, we've had some, um, had to regroup and re do some relaunching. And I'm excited to be here today. Awesome. Before we start getting into questions, um, Ginny, was there any, um, who, who's joining us? Or did I miss anybody? I think I got everybody, but who's joining us as participants? Um, Okay, we have two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve 12 states represented with multiples from Virginia and Colorado. Um, and let's see in the poll. Oh, you didn't do the poll yet. So that, that's what we have is are the people, to, we have not done the poll for their positions. 
If you can see the poll, go ahead and, and uh, take the poll on positions and uh, if it's open level of PBIS implementation. And we'll, we'll get back to that in, in a, a little bit. But I think we'll start talking about uh, rural implementation. So how about we start talking about you know, some of the challenges and some of the ways that, that you guys have looked at rural implementation um, in our schools. Yeah, so I can start us off um, from a district perspective. I think um, one of the biggest challenges I've seen, you know, my most recent roles with PBIS have been as a PBIS district coordinator. And in rural settings, you tend to wear many hats. So, you know, I'm also a board certified behavior analyst. And when I was hired um, on at Green, I was hired as the coordinator of special education. And so um, all the things that, that fell under my title um, were many things, not just PBIS, you know. And so I think in a rural district, you see that a lot. You know, it's smaller, there are less people. And so you wear more hats and um, so that was a big challenge, um, getting used to, because I came to Green from an urban area that was a medium to large school district. And so um, we had more support. Um, and when I came to Green, it was kind of just me. And so at the district level, leading everything and, you know, and so that was challenging. But um, I mean, I, I was able to tackle that um, through just professional learning. Uh, one great thing about Green is that, um, you know, PBIS receives support from the top down. They have great school district leadership there. Um, and so when you have that kind of support from the top down, you're able to secure time and space for, for professional learning. And so, you know, I was able to build the capacity of the school coaches to be more independent in this work. And um, they carried so much of the weight and of the load um, in, in completing the work there in green. So that was one way that we kind of, um, you know, maneuvered that challenge. And another thing that we did really well in green was um, laid out everything that we were going to be doing for the year. And we did that. We always had a July work day where teachers, you know, school teams were paid to come in. Um, and work for a full day with me. And so we were able to know exactly what was going to be happening each month of the year when we were doing our TFI, when we were completing our SAS and walkthroughs, you know, and so by just being very organized with our time, um, I think it was, it, it made the work much more manageable, even in our small setting. So that's, that's probably the biggest, one of the biggest challenges that I see. And to piggyback off of what Rosie was saying about that challenge of being in a small rural district is that trickled down to the school level as well, wearing many hats. Um, you know, I was the PBIS coach. I was still a classroom teacher, um, grade level chair, um, SEL coach. So definitely wearing many hats and learning how to do it well and being able, only having a small group of teachers to pull from to serve on your PBIS team when there's so many other different things that those teachers are also needed for. Um, and before Rosie came to us, we did not have any consistency when it came to district leadership in the PBIS realm. So that was another challenge as well. We were kind of on islands by ourselves at each school, even though we are a small district. Um, the, you know, the middle school was, is 20 minutes from the primary school. So that did not really allow for um, much common planning or discussions about implementation across the district. So having a stable district coordinator that has, that had the experience to come in and help guide us was a game changer um, because definitely the wearing of the many hats was a challenge at the school level as well. Another challenge that we have at the school level is parent engagement. And I think that that is across the board in rural and then um, in Title I schools. Uh, no matter what kind of implementation you're talking about, whether you're talking about PBIS or whether you're talking about getting parents in for conferences, 
student engagement is always going to be a challenge. Um, and that is consistently something that we still um, are, are not, do not have fully implemented when we do our TFI and our SAS throughout the year. That's always an area that we're lacking in. Um, we are starting to make some moves this year to get more family engagement um, that we can, you know, go into a little bit more detail later, but that um, I would say is the biggest challenge. So one of the challenges that we faced in the, the Southside School District is that um, just finding resources available for our families. Um, our families present with a lot of challenges and, uh, you know, just finding the resources available that are willing to, to come to a rural setting to, to assist our families. You know, finding community agencies and um, mental health supports that are willing to come uh, to the district to provide those um, supports to our families and our students uh, has been really challenging. Um, we don't have anything that is within the approximately 30 minutes from our from you know from our district, um, and also providing um, any kind of assistance in that sense. So we just have to be creative. And so one of the things that we've done within our district is we've built a clinic on site so that we can address those needs here within our district. Um, so we've, you know, seen other challenges as well, you know, again, with the parent engagement, you know, finding how do we get our parents engaged, um, you know, family nights. So we've started doing some things to address that and increase the family en uh, engagement as well. Um, and again, using technology as best as, that we can, as best we can to increase that uh, family engagement through Google Meets and having parent conferences using technology to increase that. So those are some of the things that we face, um, some of the challenges that we faced as well. Alejandra, that's amazing that you guys have been able to build a clinic to address those mental health needs. Um, that makes me think about, Morgan, what's happening right now in Greene County. If you could talk a little bit about that, I think would be very interesting, the wraparound services and how things are changing for mental health supports, because that is a huge challenge we saw in Green. Our closest city was 45 minutes, you know, and Athens was an hour away. Um, I drove it every day, so I know, <laughs> you know, but just being able to get those mental health supports, um, and I think Green is working on some things too. Yeah, that's funny that you said that, Rosie. I like wrote down wraparound services really quick so that I wouldn't forget to mention it because we are doing some things in Greene County this year that we have not done before. Um, of course, not really having the opportunity to do anything fully the past year and a half because of COVID. But um, so the first thing is that we now have what we have what we call wraparound services. And so we have a small team of Green County District employees that work specifically getting resources for students and families. So they're housed in our high school, which is housed um, in the city limits in the downtown of Greensboro. And they have a clothing closet. We use the Perposity app. So any student needs like school supplies or clothing or um, special things for projects, things that families might need, we can upload those needs onto the Perposity app and people who follow Greene County School District on that app are able to give that way. Um, so that kind of even reaches beyond our community, being able to get help on a larger scale. And then they also work with different mental health services. They work with different um, churches and community groups to um, provide support for parents. In fact, I recently had a parent reach out to me because she was concerned that she wasn't gonna be able to pay her light bill. She had not been working as much because she had been taking care of her mom in the hospital. And while the wraparound services does not provide monetary support, we were still able to give that mom three different phone numbers to call, three different organizations to reach out to locally that were able to assist her just by her having a quick conversation with them, giving them her electricity bill, they're able to fulfill that need. So the wraparound services is a really great tool. We also are bringing in a counseling organization called Advantage and they're gonna be meeting with students on site. So if we have students that are being referred to outside counseling, um, parents no longer have to provide the transportation. If they wanna take 
advantage of advantage, then <laughs> those counselors will come. We actually have an extra office in our gym. And so they have kind of revamped that area, um, cleaned out all the storage that was in there and made it a more friendly place. And so the students will now have a place to meet regularly with counselors um, who need it and therapy as well. Um, and we even have now telehealth opportunities specifically for therapy sessions that students can access um, through the school day, during the school day. So those are really neat things that we have that are now being able to address mental health um, and taking that load off of parents who don't have the transportation to get to um, a doctor's appointment to get meds refilled or don't have the um, you know, insurance to get regular counseling. Um, and, you know, that's a big deal because we are 45 minutes from the biggest city and there's no public transportation. We don't even have Uber or Lyft where we are. There's not even any kind of like ride share. So if you don't have transportation, then you are stuck in Greene County. Yeah, and transportation is such such a big challenge that I really love the fact that you guys are bringing stuff to the school rather than sending families out to try to find it when it, it just doesn't exist or transportation to get them there doesn't doesn't always exist. Um, I really love that um, those ideas. Um, I'm going to check in with Jenny. Did we um, have a little bit more information on uh, role or or level of implementation or anything? Yes, we have some great information. Um, today we have 46 participants and the uh, largest single group is other. So it's something other than we have 8% general ed teachers, 16% special ed teachers, 4% district level administrators. We have double that 8% school level administrators. School psychologists are well represented, 8%. Uh, school counselors, 4%. And then, of course, the others. So there are folks that may be um, obviously not in any one of those categories. And then the implementation um, areas, we it's, it's interesting here. 19% have not even started PBS yet. So they're... Um, you know, watching to learn and hear, I think, some of the challenges and, and also some of the great things that y'all have been doing. Uh, another 6% just finished training. So that's, you know, a quarter of our audience today have not implemented yet. And then 24% are one to three years and 29% three to five, which is just about half of the folks have been and then we have some outliers, five to 10 years, 17% of our um, participants. And then we have 11% say we've been doing PBIS forever. Um, <laughs> on, on what they're hoping to learn from this session today, we've only had two people uh, vote at this point, but um, best practices for ensuring collaboration with the rural community. And it's so great you've touched on that already and general tips and experience for supporting rural and other quote unquote isolated schools. For example, private schools or alternative schools who feel so disconnected from resources and similar sites. So um, that's what we have for now. We're seeing a number of different challenges that people have put in that they see things like transportation, uh, parents, involvement, resources, funding, community engagement, technology, building and staff. So I think a good bit of what you have already touched on. Um, so we've got a good group here. Great. No, this, this is awesome. And again, as you have any questions or suggestions for others, um, please feel free to add it to the the chat and if there's any questions, bigger questions, feel free to add it to the poll and Ginny will be checking and we'll check in with her as we go along. But since we do have a bunch of um, uh, new to PBIS, maybe we can talk about what is what is rural, the PBIS implementation look like? And if any of you guys were there at the start, like what did that kind of rollout look like 
what do you think it um did you have to do anything different like you, you know you, you get the blueprint here's how to roll out pbis but then you get into your setting you're like oh this might not work as how we think we need to do something a little bit different or was it the same as as what what we're all um learning so tell us a little bit about about how pbis kind of began and started in your schools if you if you were there at the beginning yeah so i I was in a school district um, from the beginning. This was back when I worked in Florida. And at that time, I was the school PBIS coach. Um, and, you know, I think the most significant thing I remember about that time, and I actually was trained by Heather George and the team at USF whenever I worked at, worked at um, the high school I worked at. And so this is a long time ago. But, you know, I think the most significant thing I remember about that time and getting started is how powerful the training experience was with the team. Um, I feel like that what is so important to really unite uh, you together as a team and in this work, because this is not easy work, as we already talked about. You know, most everybody is either a classroom teacher or, you know, a school administrator or a school counselor. And so you have this other full-time job and PBIS is also a full-time job. And so I think having very good training um, in the beginning to unite yourselves as a team um, and to establish your common goals that you're going to be working on together and remembering that you're not going to have all of the critical elements in place at year one, you know, it's going to take time um, to build on your program. And, you know, so, try not to get overwhelmed um, and try not to do everything at once because that's impossible. And so, yeah, I would say that training is critical and really building your PBIS leaders because you need people who understand this work, who care about this work and are passionate about this work to keep it going. Um, so that would be, I think, the most significant thing I can share for people to people starting out. But Morgan, you were there at the beginning of Green, and so you probably have a lot to offer uh, with, the, with the start there. Yeah, so like I said, we implemented in 2017. Uh, we actually began training with a state the summer of 2017 prior to the school year beginning. And then we trained for a semester the school team trained for a semester. And then in January of 2018 is when we did our formal rollout to our staff and to our students. And so I think that team composition is really important and it is a struggle in a rural district, at least in my experience, because I feel like in rural districts and Title I schools, you're just going to naturally have more turnover we have seen that in the past several years. We have teachers who um, drive long distances to come to school and I eventually burn out with that. And so they find something closer to home um, or you know, then you just have natural attrition, people retire. And so one thing that I would say, if you're in the very beginning process is I would try to find people who are not only passionate about the work, but that you believe are in, in it for the long haul because something that can be a challenge is having new team members every year and having to like retrain your team that kind of can often be a setback so we have been very fortunate in that we have been able to have at least half of our team has been the same for the past five years um, and then even people who maybe have switched roles and are not on the team anymore still understand pbis well enough to um, still be of great value in helping us lead the work. I tell our school, like every single person in this building is on the tier one PBIS team. It, there's no other way to look at it. I mean, it's something that we all have to be on board with to make it work. Um, and so then we just have this smaller team that's really in charge of planning things and implementing things and just, you know, distributing information. So team composition is a really big deal. Um, making sure that you have people that want to do the work um, and that are in it for the long haul because you do need to take it slow. You do need to take it slow and steady and be intentional about the things that you focus on each year because it is too much to do all at once. And the previous school that I was in, 
I was not there from the very beginning. And like I said earlier, it was more of a suburban environment. Um, and they had some really great things in place at the tier one level, but they put them into place so quickly. Um, the critical elements of the PBIS framework, they were just like, boom, 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 boom. It wasn't sustainable. Everything was done, the boxes were checked, but it wasn't set up in a way that new people coming in could sustain the work and carry it out. And so we even ended up rolling backwards, like our referrals spiked up. We went down a level in recognition from the state. And so that was something that I really preached to my new school when we were rolling out in Greene County is that we have to move slow. We have to make this sustainable work. And um, that's gonna be like my biggest piece of advice um, to anybody that, that starts this work and is in the beginning stages. And then don't make any decisions that aren't based on your behavior data because you're just gonna be creating extra work for yourself if you do that. Um, it's not gonna be intentional if you're not focused on your behavior data. So when you're coming up with those school wide expectations, they need to be based on the negative behaviors that you're seeing and that you want to change. Um, they need to be written in a positive way to teach students what you wanna see from them. Um, I think if I was to sum that up and um, give my big tips for people just starting out, Team composition, slow and steady, use your data. Yeah, I have to agree with Morgan on the slow and steady. Um, I was here from the very beginning as a district coordinator um, through the whole process. So initially the first year of implementation, we started with training and then full, you know, hit the ground running, let's go get, let's do this. Um, I think the teams were pretty um, excited, excuse me, excited, wanted to go, and they wanted to, again, check everything off the boxes. Um, then they reached some level of burnout eventually. Um, then we did some booster training, and then they regrouped. Some team members came to that training, and then we had to replace some team members. They were just not a fit. So I think that slow and steady is very, uh, it's critical. Um, and again, you need the right people on your team that are gonna be there for the long process. And again, we do have attrition and we do have uh, turnover that we have to adjust for. But if you have some good core key team members that are gonna be there through the whole process, then it'll lead to sustainability. The other thing is that we did do a separate training. Initially, we did do training for all eight campuses at one time. Um, it was over multiple days, our tier one training. Um, that was very overwhelming for our teams. They just felt like this is way too much information at one time. And I think that kind of, some teams were okay with that level of information, but some teams were just like, this is so much, we need to take this back to the campus and revisit it at another time. So you could definitely tell the difference between those campuses that took their notebook back, put it on a bookshelf and revisited you know, several weeks later versus the teams that took that notebook, actually dug into it and started implementing right away. So we also did a, um, a separate tier one training for the high school campus. And we spread that out over five days and allowed them to actually dig in and build their, their framework. And it was specifically for the high school team. And that was extremely beneficial for that group because the high school campus faces some different challenges than our middle school and elementary campuses. So they were actually to be able to build a flow chart specifically for high school students, define behaviors specifically for high school students. So allowing them to have that time to actually work together as a team over a week um, also allowed the team to grow and become cohesive and actually take ownership of the work that they were doing. And that was really helpful for our high school. And um, then once we went, once the school year started, we actually recruited students to start working with us as well and um, you know, to help the rollout. So again, to piggyback off of Morgan, slow and steady, and then the right team composition is extremely important. And just making sure that we are providing the coaching that's necessary to keep the process going. 
I just really love uh, uh, what you guys are saying. And I don't know if you guys had a chance. I know you're all in schools right now to, to see the opening session, but we had an incredible presenter. And one of the things that she was saying was like, you, you can't do it all in one day, that slow and steady approach. So the fact that you guys are saying that, and I'm not sure if you were able to make it to that. It's like, it. like that's exactly what she was saying. So I, I really love how you, how you guys are bringing that up and just contextualizing it to the rural setting. Were you going to say something before I uh, cut you off? No, I, I didn't see that. I, I wasn't able to. I taught a class this morning, so I wasn't able to see it. But um, I, I was thinking as Morgan and Alejandra were talking and seeing that we have quite a few special ed or I'm sorry, district and school level leaders um, in this presentation. Another thing that came to mind for Greene County for getting started in general and sustaining this work is funding. You know, I've worked in districts that did not set aside funding for this, and I've worked in a district, which is green, um, who did set aside funding for this, and I cannot tell you the difference that it makes um, in implementation and just motivation. Um, in Greene County, we were able, I can't speak high enough about the, the leadership there, but um, you know, they set aside Title IV funds specifically for PBIS work every year. We pay our school coaches a stipend in Greene County for doing this extra work. Um, some school administrators have been able to make extra planning periods available for the school coaches um, to have extra time out of their day to do this work. Um, and each school actually has a budget um, each year for helping to support the incentives and the visuals that, that they have made throughout the school. And so, you know, whenever school district leadership says this is important enough to have a budget line, um, you know, it, it is very powerful and um, it, you know, translates to the schools that this work is important and all the teachers, this work is important and your time is valuable. And um, so, so I wanted to make sure to throw that in. I know nobody ever wants to hear about budget, but <laughs> it is critical um, in the success of your PBIS programs. Rosie really hit one of my, struck a nerve, one of my big things there. Um, when I first came to Green, well, my first year in Green County was also our first year of implementation. And my principal knew that I had been a PBIS coach three years prior to um, hiring me in green. And I did come from a bigger district that had been doing PBIS for longer. So they did have budgets um, and stipends for PBIS coaches. And the, our first year of implementation in green, we did not. That does not mean that our administrators and district leaders weren't supportive of the work, but because it was their first year doing it too, they didn't immediately see that financial need. And so me, I made a name for myself pretty quickly because I was like, where's the money? Where's the money? This is a Title I school. I know there's federal money for this. <laughs> and um, my principal would always like roll his eyes at me and was like, oh my God, I'm working on it. <laughs> because I just wouldn't let it go. And so I'm sorry, school leaders, industry leaders, but I'm telling the teachers, make us think about it. Be nice about it, but keep pushing for it because there is money available. Um, like Rosie said, we were able to use Title IV funds and it's just, it's such a huge deal to have that because it takes so much stress off of the school team. Because in my previous school, actually I'll back up and say that we did have coach stipends, but we did not have a school budget at that point. And so we were having to fundraise all the time just to get money to have incentives for kids. And that was difficult to do with the frequency that we needed to do it for. Um, and so having that, and we still do fundraising now. We um, have a partnership with, uh, with Kona Ice. Um, I think it's a national company, but we have one local to us. And they visit us every month for our four and a half week and then our nine week incentives and the students get to, they have to bring money to pay for their Kona Ice 
during the same time as the incentive that's going on, but then we get 20% back off of what we make from that. And so part, their partnerships are still the big deal. And we still do jean days where, you know, kids get to wear jeans for a dollar and um, that sort of thing. But, you know, there's a lot of rules about um, the amount of money to, um, you know, school general funds, a certain percentage has to go towards the students too, as opposed to teachers. And that's another um, point too, is that, you know, you've got to have, positive rewards for your teachers as well. And so having a budget strictly for PBIS, you can, um, you have a little bit more wiggle room there to use it for students and for teachers, um, for incentives and rewards. And like Rosie said, it really just communicates to your school and to your teachers that because there's a, you know, a line for it and a, you know, an account number for it, then it's being taken seriously at the district level. So that is a huge way to provide support to your schools if you're a district leader um, and a huge thing to push for if you are a school leader. So what was communicated Sorry, to our- I'm very passionate about. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you, Morgan. Right, you're done. So one of the, what was communicated to the principals in our district was that if it was, if the work was included in their campus improvement plan, they would find funding for it. So as long as that was included, um, something about improving um, social emotional um, and anything related to PBIS, they would find the funding for it. Again, all of our schools are Title I. We, you know, we received ESSER funds. We have, there is funding available. It's just a matter of the principals needing to request that funding and use that funding for the work. Uh, we were extremely fortunate to begin the process of implementation. Um, with the School Climate Transformation Grant, we were awarded the, the School Climate Transformation Grant through the Department of Education. So that's how we started this process. So there was funding available. We had you know, um, extensive funding available. So that was really beneficial to us to help us get started. And now we, the funding is no longer available. So now we are having to sustain and finding other sources for funding the work. So again, like I said, we have, um, we're all, all, one, all of our schools are Title I, there's funding available, but the principals just have to include the work within their campus improvement plan so that it can be allocated for uh, PBIS. I love that. Um, and kind of related because some of the work that I've done kind of starting to do research on rural PBIS and some of the things that we're finding through that, that research lens is that the idea of you have these, these strong communities and um, that can rally around a school because of the identity of the rural community. Um, and also, um, it's hard to sometimes get families there, but if you can get them there, sometimes you can get them engaged, but it, it's just a challenge sometimes. So in terms of like working with community organizations, help support PBIS or, uh, or families, whichever, whichever one you wanna talk about, um, what are some of the things that you're finding? Uh, let's start with communities. Um, are there any kind of community engagement going on? So I know that green, uh, one thing that I like about green is that they have tapped into the local uh, newspaper and that media source will come and do stories, will come and take photos. And Morgan, I'll pass this off to you because you know more about um, how that partnership looks um, there in green. Sure, I'm glad that you mentioned the newspapers. One. We have recently had a huge push in green recently just to promote the good things that we are doing in our school district. And so building that relationship with our local papers was a very easy way to do it. So anytime that we do a PBIS event, we might have um, like a school-wide incentive. We do our best to get the newspapers there to cover it. And so if they are available, the reporters will come and they'll take pictures of our kids and they'll interview the kids. I've been interviewed a couple of times talking about what PBIS is and how we use it in our schools and why it's important. Because our local newspaper is very um, widely read in the district. It's available everywhere. It's inexpensive. 
people do read the newspaper still here. And so utilizing that, we have a um, whole, two, two whole pages dedicated usually to what's going on in the school system. We have a whole Tiger Bites page in the center of the newspaper that talks about what's going on. And so we very often have PBIS highlights, which is really great. And then we also utilize social media. And I think Alejandra, you were talking about utilizing technology to get parent involvement and parent engagement. And even when the newspaper can't come or even when they do come, we utilize um, our social media accounts to highlight the great things that the kids are doing um, and to share what PBIS looks like in our school. Um, and then I mentioned this earlier, but I'm gonna mention it again. Um, you know, Kona is our is a community partner of ours. And not only though, do we get a kickback from our, um, not only do we get a kickback from all of the money that we spend when we buy our snow cones, but they also have a student reward program kind of embedded in their company model. So we have um, a giant board in our cafeteria that says um, our school is Ohana, which means our, you know, our school is a family um, because Kona Ice, you know, kind of has like a Hawaiian theme to their company. So um, monthly when they come, we are able to submit names of students who have been going above and beyond or really exhibiting our PBIS expectations. They've been respectful or they have been responsible for their learning. They have owned their actions. So um, it's a little bit different from how we might select like a student of the month or something like that. We really focus on our PBIS expectations or even some of our um, SEL mindsets that we teach. Students who have been exhibiting those get recognized as like our Kona student of the month. And then they're recognized by Kona as well. They get a t-shirt, they usually get a soccer ball, they get a um, free like plastic refillable cup and you know a free Kona ice. And so not only does it provide us with funds, but it also is a fun thing for the kids to get to do. And some of them get recognized by that community member. And, you know, Kona is at every single community event that we do, you know, fireworks, Kona is there. Um, other community partners that we have um, like Atlas or the Boys and Girls Club, they go there too. So they're very well known in the community. And so the fact that they partner with us to help acknowledge the um, behavioral work that we're doing is pretty cool. So one way that we uh, increase community engagement is through, um, first of all, we've done Facebook Lives since um, March, 2020, we started, we launched Facebook Lives. So once a week we would do, based on the topic, we'd pick a topic and do a presentation and do it on Facebook Live. Uh, one day we would do it in English, the next day we would do the exact presentation in Spanish, just to include all of our parents. Um, so through that, we all would have parents would, um, submit questions, recommendations for um, future topics. And we would have a lot of parents join um, those Facebook Lives. So, you know, we've done that to increase, and, you know, they feel more comfortable because it's on Facebook. It is, you know, they are able to ask those questions and get those answers because it is through social media. It doesn't feel like I'm going to the school to ask a question. It's, you know, um, it provides a little bit of a buffer and it's something they're more comfortable with. So we've started doing that again with the superintendent and our district leadership team where we do um, monthly coffee talks where parents can join a Facebook Live again and they can, uh, there's a selected topic and they can ask questions. We present on, an, uh, present on the topic and then we ask, they're able to ask questions. So um, that's one way we are increasing community engagement. Uh, recently, we just uh, recognized eight students, one from each campus at our monthly board meeting so each student was recognized for being safe, respectful, responsible, and they're known as our Cardinal VIPs. So they were recognized by our, um, our district board. And so the superintendent was there, our uh, board was there, um, parents were invited and they were, each student received a certificate and a polo shirt indicating that they are a Cardinal VIP. Um, and pictures were taken, parents were invited. Um, so that's one way we are recognizing students and involving the community. And the parents, at first, you know, we were thinking, well, if we can get, you know, four out of eight parents, you know, to bring their student, you know, it is in the evening, parents work, you know, we were concerned about that. But 
we had every single student was represented and every single student had a parent come with them. And they were extremely excited to be there and to receive the award. And the parents were really proud of their students. So, and I actually had two parents call me the following day to thank me for recognizing their student and that they were just really proud. So those are some ways that we include parents and the community within our, and within our framework. I love the fact that that has that recognition piece, right? The, the reinforcement piece, but it's not just, uh, you know, um, reward tickets or little items from a school store, which are also important, especially when you're getting going, but it's also that recognition of the student and um, acknowledging their really great behaviors. So I love that because that gives you even more opportunities to recognize good behavior and, and gets beyond some of like the school stores or, or, or some of the things, again, that we start out with PBIS, really great. Before we go to another question, unless you guys have anything, I was going to check in with Jenny and see if, if uh, see how we're doing, if anybody has any questions from participants. Yeah, we do have a couple actually, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Is it Shauna Bailey? Um, has had two questions, which were actually really great. Uh, let me pull up my document. So the first question was when limited staff are available and wear many hats, do you think it's more effective or reasonable to develop school building level coaches and trainers and or district level coaches and trainers? And oh, second, I can, yeah, well, I can take yeah. that one, okay. I guess. Um, so I think it's important in the PBIS framework that you follow the model where you do have a school-based coach and you also have a district level coordinator um, you know, those roles um, serve different purposes. Um, and so if your staff is limited and as it always is, I think in rural districts, you have to get creative and think outside the box about how you're gonna make that happen. Um, but yeah, I think it is most effective to have a coach and a district coordinator in those settings. I agree. And it might be helpful um, to know maybe what our team composition looks like in a small school. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, we actually have a strange, a little bit of a strange um, setup, but we are a four seven school. Even when we were a six, eight school a couple of years ago, um, what we try to do with our team is our, all of our administrators, well, we have two administrators, but they're both involved in the team. And if one of them can't make it, they communicate to make sure that one of them is going to be at all of our monthly meetings because you definitely need administrator support. Um, I serve as the school level coach. Our counselor serves on our team. We do have a team member who has a pretty strong behavioral background. This is our first year having that though. Um, at the school level. So that's not necessary. It's definitely like great if you have that at your school building, if you have someone like that at your disposal. Um, and then we just, we try our best to have a member um, to represent each grade level. So we have one member from each grade level. We have a special education representative. Um, and so at the very least, like that makes kind of like the bare bones of a team. Um, the coach who can lead, um, it's great for the coach to have like even a team leader that they can kind of work closely with um, and one of them kind of be more actively engaged in leading meetings and organizing things while the coach is more actively engaged in um, the action plan and the assessments and knowing the framework really well. Um, and then someone who has access to behavior data and then representation from as many grade levels or as many you know building areas as you can get on your team, um, if that is helpful at all to know what the team composition looks like at our school. And then I would just real quickly add to that it's important for your district coordinator to attend as many of those school meetings as possible. Now, again, I didn't make all of them whenever I was there just because sometimes it was impossible and I was being pulled in other directions, but I, tr I made most of them. And I think that that collaboration is so important because a lot of times 
school teams have questions or need feedback. And if you're there in the moment, you can give them that direct feedback. Um, and so that's that's really important to have that close relationship with your district coordinator too. And I'd have to agree with Rosie. Um, I definitely did attend most meetings. Um, so I was in between all eight campuses attending meetings, meeting with the, the campus coaches and just um, working closely with all of them um, just to show that district level support as well as to provide that guidance that they needed. So I definitely agree that to have two separate roles of campus coach as well as a district coordinator, that's um, if possible, that's beneficial, but definitely as a district coordinator, making the effort and make, being at as many meetings as possible is also critical. We had another question, Alejandra, that is directed toward um, you um, from Shauna Bailey. Again, what time of day did you do the Facebook Live presentations? Um, we would do those in the early evening. So I think they would start um, about five, to, but I think they were starting at six o'clock. And so, um, so they would go about from six to about 6.37, depending on the number of questions that were asked. And like I said, we would do one in English on one day and the following day would be in Spanish. So some parents that, um, some Spanish speaking parents would join the English session, ask questions so that we could prepare our answers. And then they would join the English, the Spanish session the following day. So that kind of allowed us to prepare answers and look for specific information that they needed um, so that we were prepared. And then the coffee talks are done at eight o'clock in the morning on a Friday morning. Those are also, since it is a Facebook Live, they're recorded. So parents that aren't able to watch live can go back and watch that on the district Facebook page. Awesome. Um, I'll just mention two in the polls. We had um, asked and I covered a little bit on what the um, challenges are for the rural districts, but there were some great answers on uh, the strengths of rural schools that is really very different than in large districts. Um, a sense of community pride, um, the students themselves, just the closeness, of, you know, physical, the buildings and, you know, in a, uh, and let's see, relationships, small community, uh, close knit uh, and passion and pride um, were some of the, answers that people put in on the um, strengths of rural schools, which I think really, we've heard a lot of that going on here with relationships and um, the multiple populations, how you have really tailored your work toward them with multiple languages. And so some really great, great responses there. So just to piggyback off of that, um, in our district, we are all the mascot. At each campus is a cardinal. Everybody is a Southside cardinal. And so we tied that into our expectations of being safe, being respectful, being responsible, being a cardinal. So everything ties back to that mascot. And so we are all Southside cardinals. Um, and it's just that builds that sense of community. Um, and since we are just a small, small, small community. So it um, building that into our, expectations as part of um, using the mascot as part of our expectations was really beneficial. And look, um, Laura, let me just add one thing real quickly. Having worked with many very small rural districts when we started out in Georgia and um, back in that day, we were PBS, positive behavior supports until we were asked not to use that term. Um, but it was wonderful. It was a small town. We were training in the summer to prep for rolling out in the fall. And the team went ahead and made PBS's coming signs, like those real estate signs, and had them all over town just to, you know, have people, what's PBS, what's PBS? And of course, many of the people thought that it was the public broadcast system was coming and we're going to do some filming. But I mean, that's something you can do in a smaller um, community. And in that same community, then within about a year or so, they had their um, 
tickets or their bucks or whatever kids were given to be acknowledged for behavior. And they had them in the local grocery store. There was really only one grocery store in this town. And in the town they had, um, or in the store, they had the one of the expectations posters up and they had tickets in there. So employees were recognizing kids in the stores when they saw, you know, examples of that behavior. And those are some things that are a little easier to do when you're in a more close knit community and everybody knows everybody and um, thought those were some good examples. Those are really great examples. And I wanted to mention too um, about the mascot, we did the same thing. And I do think that in general, um, so we're the Tigers, Green County Tigers. And in general, I think that a good go-to is not to come up with an acronym and then try and fill it in with expectations that you want your kids to have because you do want that to be data-based um, as far as what your positive expectations are gonna be. However, we do roar, our tigers roar, and it actually just worked out that the behaviors that we see most often, we are able to fit in, be respectful, own your actions, act safely, and be responsible for your learning. Um, so that is something that we've been able to do as well. And the high school also tigers roar. And so it's very easy. Um, we've been able to kind of like brand, you know, that logo and that saying almost across the district, you know, Tigers Roar, and students know that you're referring to their school-wide expectations. And um, Rosie, you're going to have to correct me if I'm wrong, because time means nothing now, but I believe it was in 2020, like before, before March 2020, we did um, PBIS training with our district bus drivers. Yes, and, we did. Okay. And so because we are a small community, we have one bus route and we've got pre-K students on a bus with 12th graders. And so we felt it, you know, very important that students were being explicitly taught bus expectations because it was an extension of the school building and because we had an outrageous number of bus referrals. And so we did um, formal state training with the bus drivers and we worked through what they needed from students on the bus and we looked at the bus referrals and the behaviors and we were actually able to have their expectations on the bus to be tiger's roar and exactly what that looks like on the bus for everyone in the district and so that is another nice thing about being in a small town and a small community in a rural district um, where you can use that to your advantage because like with our kids, like their grandparents and great grandparents, some of them graduated from Green County High School. And so that is a big source of pride. And so when you're able to play off of that, it really does make a difference. And I would just add to that with that bus training, you know, another tip for newer implementing schools or school districts that have been implementing for a while is reach out to your state PBIS representatives and your RISA, you know, districts or your extension, you know, regional um, extension services, because they will come in and help you. You don't have to reinvent the wheel there. You know, these, these states employ um, amazing trainers. And so in a rural district, I feel like we really heavily relied on our RISA PBIS representatives and our state representative um, for whatever training needs that we had. And with that bus training, you know, call the state and say, hey, we need a bus training <laughs> for our drivers. And, and, you know, we had it on the schedule within a couple of weeks. And so use your resources. Don't feel like you have to do it all on your own or um, create this new content or reinvent the wheel because um, these legends have gone before us. <laughs> and so use those resources. Um, as much as you can. I love this. I just get so excited hearing you guys talk. It makes me it makes me uh, want to get out there and and do more. Um, just just because what you guys are doing is just absolutely amazing. Um, I have a question, and this isn't one we prepared for. So if you want to pass, it's okay. But um, tier two and tier three. And I'm, I'm telling you, tier two and tier three for all schools, forget the setting, is tough to get into, even though we say we're tiered and we really want that tier two, we want that tier three. It's a little bit easier sometimes to implement our tier one, especially with fidelity. 
and then then we kind of end up going up the tiers for even though again it's not necessarily designed like that but how are you guys doing on on full implementation of all the tiers and it's okay if it's an ongoing process yeah so one thing that we've been working on the past two years in green county is that we have embraced um you know an mtss model um and really trying to approach intervention you know for the whole child and so of course that is behavior and that is mental health supports and um i mentioned earlier that i'm a bcba and so you know and somebody commented i saw in the chat i love you know seeing applied behavior analysis being implemented in schools and that is important that is how we change behavior that is the science of behavior change and so being able to work with schools to develop those tiered interventions that are more individualized for students and is so important and so critical because um, you know students need different things and so that tier one universal awesomeness that is PBIS um, may not work for every kid and so we have done a lot of work um, over the past couple of years with getting school wide check in check out implemented and teaching teachers um, and teaching school administrators and building their capacity in uh, FBAs and BIPs and being able to do that work. And so um, it's not easy, y'all. It's not easy. I mean, ABA, school-based ABA is not easy and it's a continuous learning ongoing process. Um, but I feel like Green has done a great job and especially the middle school. Morgan, I don't know if you wanna add any to that about your processes there. Absolutely. And I think that um, the first thing I'll say is going back to what you said about reaching out to your state representatives for PBIS, because uh, when Rosie and I felt and my school administrators felt like we had reached a place with our tier one Im implementation, that we were ready for some more formal tier two training, the state was immediately able to come out and provide that for us. And when I say come out and provide that for us, we did it on Zoom, but <laughs> We, you know, felt very good about the tier one that we had in place and we were doing um, check in, check out informally and not really with fidelity. Um, and so going through the tier two PBIS training with the state was kind of a game changer for us because we were really able to see they open our minds to so many more things we hadn't thought about in regards to the implementation of check-in check-out and what it should really look like to be done with fidelity um so that is some work that we've been doing for the past two years um we have a separate tier two team um it's much smaller than our tier one team um and there's only myself our school counselor behavior support administrators and then one other member from the tier one team who's kind of a liaison between between both teams um, to help us communicate what's going on with with both um, PBIS teams and so we're able to just take a much closer look at behavior and students who are in need of interventions we implemented a universal behavior screener at our schools in Greene County and so we're doing that a couple of times a year. We've just kind of wrapped up our first round. And so what we'll do is we'll look at cut scores from that universal behavior screener and students who hit a certain criteria will immediately be flagged to be um, receive the check-in, check-out intervention. Um, we went ahead at the beginning of the year and immediately put students who had not graduated from check-in, check-out at the end of last school year on check-in, check-out at the beginning of this school year to go ahead and get them started and it headed in the right direction before we had universal behavior screener scores. Um, and I think that that's going really well. I mean, for most students, check-in and check-out is very beneficial um, when, it, when it's being done with fidelity. Um, we did have a little bit of, of um, turnover in our um, intervention coordinator um role and so i would say that it's not quite as strong as it was last year but we are getting there um, and it is still helpful for our students um, and then tier three is definitely somewhere that we're still is still ongoing and needing more support um, for what to do with those students who need tier three interventions and we do have things in place um 
and Rosie, you may want to talk a little bit more about this if I don't get it all right. But um, once, you know, if we created a flow chart for students graduating from check in, check out, or also evaluating if check in, check out is not working for them, then we would obviously look at moving them to tier three if another two tier support was not going to work for them um, or did not work for them. There's also another cut score on the universal behavior screener that flags students as tier three. Um, and at that point, if we believe that students need tier three support, we have another survey that we do that kind of looks more into what the function of their behaviors are um, and helps us identify some strategies that we could use with them. But that's definitely an area that we would need, you know, more support. And then to answer that, that, you know, tier two and tier three are an ongoing process, um, you know, just kind of revisiting the framework and identifying, you know, the specific needs and identifying the interventions that we have available, you know, now after COVID. Um, we've also been really working extensively um, prior to COVID, um, developing our MTSS framework and kind of looking again at the the whole child. So integrating our behavior, our academic and our social, emotional and mental health supports. Um, we've developed a for, um, flow chart for, for elementary and secondary, you know, just because they have different needs um, and identifying not just academic behavioral and um, social emotional, but some of those external things that may be affecting them, such as, you know, do you live in a home without electricity or water? You know, how does that affect you? You know, do you have, um, you know, are you in the foster care system? Do you, you know, do you have a parent that's incarcerated? Some of those external factors that schools may not always be aware of that are affecting our students. So we definitely included those factors into our MTSS framework. And, you know, again, it is a slow process in rolling that out. So we're slowly getting that going um, and again, just slow and steady. And I appreciate you guys answering that one because it's really tough. And when we have these conversations across the country on, on where we're struggling with PBIS, it's often the tier two and tier three, like we have stuff in place, but we still need more work to get it to fidelity or we need outside consultants like a BCBA to help us really structure tier three a little bit better. So it's, it's, it's a tough question. So I appreciate your honesty. You guys all, can all kill me later. <laughs> Um, we're just about wrapping up the last two minutes. So um, is there any last words you want to share share with us uh, in our final two minutes on uh, words of wisdom to wrap it up? Just a quick word um, of wisdom is to piggyback off what you just said. Um, you know, board certified behavior analyst in schools can make such a powerful difference to that tiered intervention support. And so if your school district doesn't have one, um, think about that. You know, I think that position and that work is growing considerably and rapidly in school districts, and it can be a very important piece to your behavioral and discipline puzzle. Um, so get yourself a BCBA. <laughs> And this is the right work. There's a lot of things that are, you know, come and go in education. And this isn't one of them. Um, it's not a program. It's not, you know, something that is going to go anywhere. And it's the right work for kids. It doesn't need to go anywhere. Um, and so even when you feel like it's not working, that's another thing, y'all. It's going to take three to five years before you actually start to see true results and true changes in your building. So if you're like in year one of implementation or you're excited because you're about to get started, like it's going to be great, but it is going to take three to five years. So please don't get discouraged when you don't see the results that you want immediately. Um, and, you know, just keep it up. And I would have to say, focus on building those positive relationships with the stakeholders. Um, they may not come to you, so you have to meet them where they are. So whether that's going down the hall and having a meeting with a teacher or having that meeting with the administrator in a, you know, parking lot or going out to a student's home, 
and visiting with the parents that way. You know, they're not always going to come to you. Um, so you just need to focus on building those positive relationships. And um, it's going to take a lot of work. We're out of time now, so I, we're just going to say goodbye to everybody, but thank you so much. The, my only regret with this panel is that I can't take you all to dinner because I would love to keep <laughs> chatting forever. I love these women. They're so amazing. And every time I leave, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so many new ideas that they're bringing up in every <laughs> conversation. We practiced a couple of times. So I wanted to thank everybody. Uh, Ginny, do you have any other final words for us? Uh, no, we really don't. Just the please, please, please complete the evaluation for this session. The link has been posted several times. So we ask you to do that. That just helps us get better all the time. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, if there's any any questions, feel free to, to uh, reach out uh, uh, to us. Um, you should be able to get me through the platform through email and it connects with my USF uh, email. So that's about it, but thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much to our panel. Bye. Bye everyone. <laughs>